Welcome. Welcome to Move to Learn, which is the Handspring webinar series for manual therapists and movement educators. Our guest today is David Lazondak, who's the author of Fascia, What It Is and Why It Matters. Uh, before the introduction to David, let's go over some um, uh, participant suggestions of how you can best participate and how you can join us for the Q&A and in the chat. Um, Hillary, and we'll have that first slide, I believe. Okay, so the, um, you can expect 45 minutes of discussion and directed practice. And the chat will be on throughout. So we encourage you to say hello and tell us where you're joining from. We welcome your questions. Please submit these questions using the Q&A button on your screen and David will answer as many as time allows. Um, David has said that he has uh, uh, up to 10 minutes past the hour. So um, at the hour, uh, we will show the, uh, the screen that gives you the discount code for ordering his book, and then we'll come back and answer uh, your questions and engage in discussion with you. Just a reminder that we are recording this webinar and so that your comments on the chat will be included in that document and that uh, we'll share the link for this recording in a follow-up email. This, is, uh, this webinar is also being streamed live on YouTube, so if you're not able to get into the room to participate, please join us on YouTube. And finally, we have a discussion. Uh, disclaimer, the discussion is for informational and illustrative purposes only and is not meant to impart medical or therapeutic advice or instruction. We refer you to David's wonderful book, Fascia, What It Is and Why It Matters, for more information. Now an introduction to David Lazondak, author of Fascia, What It Is and Why It Matters. David joins us today from the um, Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, where he maintains a clinical practice in structural integration, visceral manipulation, and other fascial modalities at the Center for Integrative Medicine. He has been doing clinical body work for over 25 years. Certified in Anatomy Trains, Structural Integration by Thomas Myers, David is a board-certified structural integrator, a fascial fitness trainer, visceral manipulator via the Baral Institute, and he's also certified by Ann and Chris Frederick as a fascial st stretch therapist at level one. David has been lecturing widely and has prepared a unique presentation for us to bring you up to date with the most uh, recent information relevant to your practice from the fascial research world. David Lazondak, welcome to Move to Learn. Thank you. It's really great to be here. I just uh, want to say hi to uh, everybody who I can see in the chat panel has joined in. And uh, I also uh, want to say hello to everybody who might be streaming this live on YouTube right now. So thanks for taking time out of your day to be here with me. Uh, I don't know where you are in the world, though I see we have some people from Quebec and Singapore and Barcelona. Um, but I've actually been back to work now for uh, just about uh, three months. And so I'm sitting here, standing here actually, in, in my treatment room. So you can see there's a door, wow, exciting. There's a treatment table, there's a treatment table. There's some boxes that I've set my laptop on so that we can have a nice, clear picture here. Um, so uh, just like you clinicians out there, things are, aren't too different here for me. Uh, though I do have the mask up thing going on. And hey, by the way, this right here, lean into it, right? This is technically known as mask. Um, so that's a brand new sciencey term uh, that you should know. Um, so anyway, uh, let's get to the lecture portion of our thing. 
and I need the screen sharing enabled. There we go. So I'm going to top over to there. We're going to go to there. And we're going to roll them, kids. All righty. So. Dun, 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 dun. Hang on. Share computer sound. Optimize screen. And oh, it wants me to type in my password. Probably because I'm on the hospital's uh, internet line. Their, their firewalls are different. So anyway, hang on a second here. OK, so uh, there we go. All right. So I titled this talk, Fascist Still Matters, or Why Fascist Still Matters, because uh, I don't know about you, but I, I, have, uh, I, I have been hearing in the ethers and, uh, and such, uh, there's a very interesting pushback on the idea that we can't change tissue uh, or that what we're feeling is manual therapists is maybe not accurate to what our brain tells us we're feeling or that really it's all about the nervous system and everything else is secondary. Uh, those are interesting uh, interesting approaches. I, of course, myself uh, have a bias in the other things. Um, and the great thing about Google is that Google is, is kind of uh, a bias generator. You can find any information that you're looking for to tell you exactly what you already believe, as opposed to looking for things that, uh, that are maybe pointing in a direction that, that's more towards, uh, towards a scientific truth. Uh, and we're going to unpack a little bit of that today. We're also going to go over some of the basics, because I don't know who's all in the audience and where you're at in your fascial education. So there'll be a bit of a review. And Elizabeth, give me a high sign when we're at the 40 minute mark so I can stay on point. So let's get rolling. I mentioned I'm from Pittsburgh. That's what the city looks like on a good day. I, I mean, a good night. Let's be reasonable. And uh, I'm speaking to you from my office at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center at their Center for Integrative Medicine. So this is where we do things like different types of fascial uh, bodywork approaches, uh, psychology, EMDR, acupuncture, chiropractic, um, all sorts of interesting mind-body disciplines, but within uh, a medical context, which I think is just a fabulous, fabulous place to be. Now, I've become a little uh, famous for this uh, book thing that I wrote, uh, which according to Hillary over there at Handspring tells me is now in 10 languages, so I think I missed one of them. Uh, and I can't tell you how just delighted I am at what a warm reception this book has received. Because I, I feel, at least in, in the United States, that we're in a profoundly anti-science climate right now. And uh, I really feel it incumbent on me as a very deeply curious clinician to, to the more I can understand what's going on under my hands uh, or under my stretch or my clients or patient stretch. Uh, if I understand the mechanisms of change, the better I can facilitate that change rather than just uh, cooking to a recipe or painting by the numbers, if you follow my metaphor. So I feel really deeply touched that uh, the, the, the message, the science communication is coming through. Uh, and the good thing about science is it's true whether or not you believe in it. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson, my spirit animal. And um, the thing about fascist science is it's an emerging field of science and it's on the frontier, which means we're gonna be constantly getting new information in. And some of that new information may change or, or may actually overturn some of the information we previously thought. I'm very happy to tell you that we've gotten a lot of new information just in the few years since my book has been published and even happier to tell you that the fundamental information in the book is still all accurate. What we have learned is more and our understanding becomes more sophisticated and likewise our questions then can become more pointed uh, in the process. So I'm gonna share some of that with you. But the important thing to remember is that it's a both and scenario. Fascia is both a tissue 
and a system. So this is hard for some people to wrap their heads around, in, particularly in the medical world. It's one thing or it's another thing. Well, not here. So when we talk about fascia, we're talking about all collagen-based soft tissues, and it surrounds and interpenetrates all muscles, organs, bones, and nerves. And uh, I want to take a, a brief mention on that uh, <clears throat> on that uh, bullet point there, because uh, some of you may be familiar with the researcher Neil Tysa. He came to some notoriety for a paper two years ago on the interstitium. This came out shortly after my book was published. That talked about these fluid-filled spaces in the body that sort of work as a chemical superhighway. Uh, for cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication and for biochemical transportation. So we kind of looked at that research and we said, oh yeah, that sounds a lot like the superficial fascia. So Neil has been uh, very kind in collaborating with us in the Fascia Research Society. And uh, he and his team just submitted a paper for publication that is under review that actually looked at how far that perfusion goes. So they use tattoo dyes, and they used uh, putting colloidal silver on the surface of the skin. And they were able to image that these substances were able to pass through what in conventional medicine was considered a hard collagenous barrier, but it's really not a hard collagenous barrier. Uh, it's a much more fluid and dynamic system than that. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the pictures to share that with you uh, because it's not published yet, but I can talk about it. And uh, hopefully the next time I'll be able to share the pictures with you because it's really, really exciting that the science is pointing out the interconnectivity that we've always kind of believed in. We could feel it in our bones, if you will. Uh, and the reality is even more spectacular. And you're going to see that in the pictures I will be showing you. So uh, here's our old traditional picture of a muscle. In this case, it's a cross section of a thigh. That's the femur sitting right in the middle of it with the quadriceps on top and the hamstrings at the bottom. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to turn that into a real picture of a human thigh. We're going to dissolve the muscle tissue and we're going to spin it around. So when we talk about the fascial network, it's the tissue surrounding and interpenetrating those muscles, but it's also forming this body-wide system of interconnectivity and tension. And some tension is good for you. You can't do things without tension. The problem is, and especially now, we often live in an environment where we have too much tension, uh, particularly in the year 2020. So this is the system and the tissue that we're gonna be talking about. Here's a beautiful picture of the next piece down, the lower leg uh, from the Plastinarium in Gubin. Now, how many people watching have been to a Body Worlds exhibit? Go ahead, raise your hands. I can't see them, but raise your hands anyway, because it's fun. Um, this is shows you in all the white spaces, the, uh, the collagen network surrounding and interpenetrating all the muscular tissue. These are the things that we don't see in most conventional anatomy books. These are the things that uh, aren't present in most people's conventional understanding of their body. We're trying to turn that over. So uh, Andrea Blooming likes to say that fascia is your soft skeleton. And if you look at that picture, I think you can quite clearly see what he means when he says that. And it's a great way to language what fascia is when you're speaking to your clients and your patients. You have your bones, which are your hard skeleton, and your fascia, which is your soft skeleton. Uh, fascia is both fluid and fiber, okay? That's, the, that's more of this both hand thing. And the fiber, of course, is what you're seeing there in the picture in the lower center with the white stuff that's from a fresh uh, tissue dissection we did about 10 years ago. Uh, and it's predominantly the collagen that uh, has the fiber in it. And what you're looking at at the uh, upper portion of your screen is an ultrasound image of the different layers. And I put a link to the superficial fascial layer and put an arrow into that uh, picture on the lower right of your screen, which shows more of the extracellular matrix, the biochemical milieu of the superficial fascia, which is a loose, disorganized areolar fascia. Think of it as you've got skin, you've got fat, you've got superficial fascia, which on a fiber level is disorganized and kind of like seaweed floating in this 
liquid milieu. And then you've got the more regular bag of the deep fascia, which you can see highlighted there with the very thick blue band in the ultrasound picture. So this is another way of looking at what we just saw in the previous battery of slides. Now, in terms of trying to get more awareness out uh, to the public in general, uh, some friends of mine have been working for two years now on uh, the fascial net plastination project. So uh, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not have heard of it. What you're seeing there in the middle is the empty room at the Lash Fascia Research Conference, which we then turned into the room on the picture next to it, where we exhibited for the first time actual models, actual real live dead models of fascia that were excised from the body and then plastinated in the methods used uh, by the body world's exhibits. This had never been done before. Uh, we were not even sure that it was actually possible. And if you want to experience this exhibit, which doesn't currently exist, uh, you want to download that app. Otocast, O-T-O-Cast, and the icon looks like what you see there in the green. And if you download that app and put in the keywords fascia and Berlin, you are going to get a rich, rich experience of all of the ex all of the pictures of what was at this exhibit. You're going to get written uh, descriptions of the process of the exhibit pieces, and you're also going to get uh, a narration that you can listen to both in English and in German. And this app is a free thing. Uh, it's primarily a tourism app uh, for uh, different arts events and things. So download it now, Otocast, put in the keywords fascia and or Berlin. It's going to come right up and it's going to blow your socks off because it's full of images like this. David, we'll just note that the, the Fascial Net Plastination Project uh, just started up uh, this week in its um, next phase, preparing um, the plastinates for the Fascia Research Congress that will be held in Montreal in 2021. So people can, uh, can get onto the Fascia Research Congress uh, site, society site, and find out more about this upcoming conference. That's correct, Elizabeth. Uh, and what you're seeing on the left of your screen is the infamous IT band with the gluteus maximus behind it and the tensor fascia lata uh, to the fore of it. So, um, but I want you to see the profusion of fibers in this thick tough, highly regular band in terms of fiber direction. By the way, 80% of the muscle fibers of your gluteus maximus insert into your IT band. The IT band itself has 98% parallel fibers. It's really not meant to stretch, it's meant to support. Uh, and what you're seeing to the right is the absolutely beautiful pericardium, the fascial bag of the heart, cosseted, nestled there on top of the epimyseal fascial sheath of the diaphragm muscle. So they have a very, very intimate relationship, the pericardium and the diaphragm. And uh, speaking to what Elizabeth just mentioned, uh, what, uh, what my friends Gary Carter and uh, Jahan are working on right now in the lab, uh, this we're talking about a team of 12 people that's been reduced to two because of the circumstances we all have to work under right now. But they are working towards the first full body fascial plastinate. So what we're hoping to unveil at the Fascia Research Congress, uh, which will take place in Montreal in September of 2021, is an actual head to toe unveiling of what a full fascial body looks like. Now, when I say that, all of you have something very specific in your imagination that you're seeing. Um, and I don't know that what you're seeing in your head is what we're gonna see in reality. I, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of seeing some of the preliminary sketches for what they're gonna show. Uh, and it should be very, very, very exciting. They're gonna have to keep some muscle tissue in places. They're gonna have to keep some, some other things in place to give the model its support. Uh, so that it uh, so that we'll be able to uh, stand on its own two fascial feet.
but uh, what they're doing is really, really exciting and should go a long way towards uh, creating more fascial education in the public via the Body Worlds exhibits. I'd like to also mention that a few of the pieces that were created by Gary and Jahan and Rochelle and many more people than I can possibly mention uh, are actually on permanent display at the Body Worlds in London and the Body Worlds in Berlin. And they're looking at commissioning some additional pieces because the reception has been so fantastic. So uh, this is this is some of the cutting edge of, of what we're working on right now in terms of really bringing this fibrous network into reality. Now, the thing to remember is that fascia, uh, let's get back to uh, things we can use. Fascia is adaptive and it's maladaptive. So uh, your collagen network is designed to respond to supply and demand. And this is a very, very, very good thing. It allows us to get strength and support with the things we do use every day. So right now, for example, I may look like I'm uh, in a normal position because you're just seeing me from here up. But I've actually got one leg on, on a stool and my other leg firmly planted on the ground. So if I stood like this eight hours a day, I would have a very different collagen organization on my leg that's planted on the ground because I've got much more force going through that leg than I do through the leg that's bent and the foot that's on the chair. Now, I wouldn't want to do this eight hours a day, five days a week, but if I did in a matter of months, I would have a much thicker, denser collagen network on the leg that's getting most of the compressive force. So that's kind of my body's way of saying, hey, maybe you want to get off that and uh, change your posture a little bit. Now, often the people I work with aren't as aware that, wow, I'm doing things very one-sided as opposed to the other sided. Now, what you're looking at here in this picture is the opposite of what I just explained, okay? What you're looking at on picture A is a regular collagen network. What you're looking at in picture B is that same collagen network after three weeks of immobility. So the fiber direction becomes very disoriented. And when the fiber direction becomes disoriented, that's when pain and other maladaptations can occur. And when we have an accident, when we have an injury, when we're recovering from a surgery, what is our natural tendency to do? We wanna pull in and we wanna protect that and not perturb the area that has been insulted. And that works on a level even beyond just the, the simple biomechanics of it. Uh, there is a um, rather famous uh, therapist in France. I'm forgetting his name in the moment because that's how famous he is. Um, but he actually observed that in women who were diagnosed with breast cancer, that the very act of diagnosis, when they would walk and use normal gait and swing their shoulders the way you do, swing your shoulders opposite when you're moving, they would pull in and hold the side of the diagnosis very still. The shoulder and the arm would not swing freely during gait. And this became a key to him developing therapies, manual and movement therapies uh, to assist his patients with breast cancer to get things active and moving again. So that not only is the collagenous and the fibrous network working better, but also the biochemical superhighway doesn't start developing detours in it. Okay, let's move on. So the other important thing in this relationship is hyaluronin, uh, conventionally known as hyaluronic acid. Okay, uh, and to my understanding, I do not believe that taking hyaluronic acid pills really will do for you what manual therapy can do for you, okay? Now, your fascia is rich in hyaluronin. It is the lubricating fluid of the body. It's what allows muscles and nerves and capillaries to slide on each other and not get snagged, okay? Uh, the fascia actually biosynthesizes hyaluronic a hyaluronin via tiny, tiny cells called, of course, are there big cells? Well, relative to other cells, I'm sure there are. Real, uh, tiny cells called fascocytes. So they actually hang out in the layers between one muscle and another muscle. So they're very predominant in the epimyseal layers 
between muscles. And when they are, when they are stimulated by shear, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, when they're stimulated by shearing motion, so sliding relevant to another surface, uh, that's what tends to activate fasciocytes uh, to produce the hyaluronin. Now, what happens when hyaluronic, what happens when there aren't shearing motions? What happens when we don't move? What happens when we have a scenario like this? Well, it's interesting because the hyaluronin gets an increased viscosity. It actually gets more densified. And then that actually inhibits further sliding. So this is obviously not a good thing. So as I said, what is shear? That's compression. A lot of remaining therapies compress. Shear compresses and it slides. So if you think about a car hydroplaning on a wet road, that's kind of what we're trying to do when we're using shear in our manual therapies, when we're doing myofascial release, okay? So a lot of people say, well, what are you really releasing? And I've got to tell you, in the context of manual therapy, a release is a subjective felt inner experience on the part of the person. Not on my part as the therapist, but on the part of the person, there is that inner feeling of letting go. And that inner feeling of letting go is usually accompanied by a decrease in tension and often accompanied by a palpatory difference on the part of the therapist, me we are believing now that some of that has to do with this change in viscosity of the hyaluronin as in term, rather than specifically, oh, that the fascia itself is changing because that's a much slower turnover. Uh, and of course, uh, in terms of how we language the change that we feel as therapists, we don't have a clear language on that. And you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, I have the word yet in yellow. And that's a website you might want to jot down because in May of 2021, there is going to be the first ever International Manual Therapy Conference. So we're trying to pull everything together under one tent and allow that there are specifications. Chiropractic is not massage therapy, is not structural integration, is not osteopathy, but they do overlap. So where do they overlap? What can we, what can we say, what can we scientifically say the overlaps are? How can we describe more specifically uh, what we do in a very scientific manner so that we can study it and measure it better and get it more recognized in the medical context. So if that gets you going, you might want to check out the IM, ICMT conference because this is definitely going to be in your wheelhouse. So I mentioned shear and I mentioned compression. I didn't mention stretch. So the three, three, three key components of a myofascial or fascial release is compression, shear, and stretch. Now when I work, I have the patient do the stretching for me. So I compress to the point where I feel like, okay, if I go any further, uh, I'm gonna encounter some resistance on their part. That becomes the first barrier to resistance. And I find the right angle, and then I get them to very, very, very slowly stretch. And then I begin to feel a change in, I perceive it as pliability. What felt hard or rigid suddenly becomes softer and slightly more mobile. Uh, and, uh, and that continues to progress uh, with repeat applications. What you're looking at here is research from 10 years ago that up in the upper left of your screen with the control group shows a healthy, active, living cell culture. And then to the picture on the right, you're looking at that same cell culture after eight hours of repetitive motion stretch. So they basically put this cell culture on a suction device and the suction device did this and stretched and stretched and strained that cell culture for eight hours in one particular way. A lot of people that we see have jobs that involve a lot of repetitive motion problems. So this is how disorganized the network, the intracellular network gets from repetitive motion strain. Uh, the most interesting of all of the data that we got from that, or they got from that, uh, was a 30% increase in cell death from the repetitive motion. So on a cellular level, not so healthy for the cellular tissues. What you're seeing in picture D on the lower right was that same tissue 
after they reconfigured the Petri dish, the flexible Petri dish that the cells were in to do compression and shear with a stretch. And they found basically that 60 seconds of compression, shear, and stretch can undo the damage of eight hours of repetitive motion. This was, this was a landmark study. And they picked 60 seconds at random uh, as a time interval. So it was just like, okay, what seems like a reasonable amount? Well, what's the reasonable length of a typical release if you were working on a body? Well, maybe about a minute for that particular part. So let's do a minute. Um, so when people say, what are you doing and how does it work? This is one of my go-tos. Now, 10 years later, they also showed that um, using uh, bioengineered tendons that... Um, that when you when you do this compression stretch and shear that causes the fibroblasts the cells that generate the collagen to proliferate and generate more collagen in the area to heal the wound so there's there's another thing happening there too in the cases of active wounds and of course i think about uh post-surgical situations and the manual interventions that we might do post-surgically when i see that study Here's an even more exciting one, and this just happened earlier this year. This is from the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Uh, and this is from my colleague Antonio Stecco using a very specific type of MRI. And this type of MRI is called a uh, row one MRI. And it is very, very good for musculoskeletal mapping. And it's about time we had an MRI that did that. So what you're seeing in the pre picture, if you look in the upper right of your screen with the arrow pointing to the red zone. So that red zone is our area of interest And that red zone indicates a densification of the hyaluronin in that area. And what you're seeing, and this is, these are a series of, of, uh, of cuts of down the, the, the forearm here around the elbow area, what you're seeing is in the post line, what a simple cross fiber knuckling, uh, the densified hyaluronin in that area. And the other really clever thing that they did, you'll notice that that red zone is on both sides of the forearm, but they deliberately did not treat both sides of the forearm so that they sort of had a control within within the arm to compare and contrast the treated side to versus the untreated side to. So this is particularly exciting because it's the really the first time on the macro level that we have visual imaging of what a manual intervention can do in the human body. So I'm very excited to see how this particular piece of research gets replicated and proliferates. Now, for those people saying it's all the nervous system, you need to remember that depending on which model you use, there's an estimated 100 million to 250 million nerve endings in your fascial network. So if we're at the upper end of that scale, we actually have much more nerve endings in our fascia than we do our skin itself. And um, Darren Lapome, who researches psychophysics, which is what's the science of how we feel how we feel, uh, says that it's not just the mechanoreceptors in the skin. And by the way, those, my friends, are the mechanoreceptors. Yes, if we're on the internet playing, what band is this? This band is the mechanoreceptors. They were very popular in synth pop during the 1980s. Bet you didn't know that. But let's go back to Darren Lapome. So the ligaments, uh, the mechanoreceptors in the knuckles, the elbow, the shoulder, he, they all are used to sense minute differences you, utilizing the fascial network here. And he did a very clever experiment showing that humans can discriminate surfaces one molecular layer thicker than another. So when you put your hand on a surface, there are certain aspects of it that uh, you know if you're touching a brick uh, or a piece of uh, plastic uh, or metal, tin in this case, uh, I don't have, uh, or rubber, by the squeaky Buddha, squeaky Buddha, um, or, or wood. Part of that is the thermal conductivity. 
So there's different, all those different substances give off heat at a different rate. That's part of how we process what we touch. There's also the, the surface skill, the roughness or lack of roughness. Obviously wood is gonna be rougher than metal and rubber cell phone and cappuccino Buddha is gonna be somewhere in between those in terms of roughness. So what he did is he created a piece of metal identical uh, uh, three pieces of metal, completely identical. Uh, one molecular layer, one piece was one molecular layer thick than the other. So there would be no differences in terms of temperature when the subjects felt them. And he just said, here you go. Uh, here's three here's, here's three strips. I want you to just rub your finger down it. See if you can feel the difference. And these were just normal everyday people. They weren't people like you and me doing this all day long. And can you distinguish a difference between the three? Which one feels different to you? One of these things is not like the others. And the hit rate on the 65 people that he tested was 71% correct. That is a huge number of positives in any study, let alone this. So um, what you think you're feeling is probably what you're feeling. And for you manual therapists out there like me doing this all day long, I have the belief that just like anything else you do with regularity, it increases your sensitivity, whether it's Pilates or yoga or manual therapy. The more you do something or music, the more sensitive you are to the nuances of what you're doing. This study seems to be indicating to me that my, my biased belief in that is correct. Another test was done using tools. So maybe some of you use tools in your trade, or maybe some of you use uh, things like um, foam rollers and such. Um, well, our sensory processing system is designed to process what we feel beyond the body. Um, so, you know, if you've ever used a hammer, that hammer, if you're good at it, feels like part of your hand. Uh, I have an electric sander that I use that's an oscillating sander. And when I get going with it, it's just a rhythm. It's, it's like, I don't feel like I'm using a tool at all. I'm just using my hand in a, in a really interesting way. And with our foam rollers and such, it's possible that that works too, because that's the way we're built. Our somatosensory processing extends beyond our hands into the tools that we use, whether they're tools to build, tools to create music, tools to do therapy with, tools to do self-care with. And this is very, very, very exciting to me. Um, the results, by the way, in the study that I just showed were over 90% in some cases. This is way beyond random chance. They basically just tapped on a, had somebody hold a tool, tapped on it in different places, and they had to say where they felt the tap. Of course, they could not see this at the time. This is, again, this is one of those studies that you just don't get those kind of numbers. It's very, very rare. Um, and very, very briefly, because this is a piece of research I'm still unpacking, where you focus matters too. So um, it's important to stay connected to your patient. It's important to pay attention to what you're doing. And that's difficult because we're humans and we get distracted. But in a functional MRI scenario, um, they found that with sustained touch, when somebody is being, let me, let me phrase this correctly. Um, it's always, you know, it's always a challenge to speak to a room full of people who aren't there. Because by now, I'm sure I would have had a question or two or saw somebody going, wait a minute, does that mean? And it would have given me a break. So let me think about how I want to phrase this. So what they did is they did an fMRI. They did a functional MRI on the brain of a person. That person was being touched by another person. The person doing the touching either had to focus on the tactile experience of what they were touching, what it felt like, including motility. Um, and then in another set of experiments, they had to focus on a audio pulse distraction, okay? And the curious thing is when you focus your tactile experience on what you're feeling, it changes the brain waves of the person being felt. And what they found is when you allow yourself to be distracted, it does not have the same effect on the insular cortex. And it's the insular cortex that processes all of our interoception. This is why it's so important 
when we're doing our work to try to stay focused, try to stay clear, and try to stay connected with the person that's going on, uh, with the person that we're treating, regardless of what's going on in our personal life, in our global situation. It's important to come in, get quiet, stay focused, and give that person all of our attention and all of our intention, because it seems to have an effect on how that person perceives what we're doing. So how's, how's that for some science? So um, we're coming to the David, point David, it's actually perfect timing, um, <laughs> because it's, as you uh, requested, your time check, it's 40, it's, we're at the 40 minutes past the hour, and a great segue into the, um, into the, the self-care uh, demonstration and participation you had planned. That's right. So we're going to do a little self-care uh, interoceptive work here. Um, so we're going to switch to uh, away from my slides. But before we switch away from the slides, I just wanted to give a plug for uh, my next project, which is a podcast called Body Talk. It's currently in production, and we're looking to actually have it uh, out sometime in mid to late fall. So mid to late October is my hope, and I think it might be more like mid-November, but uh, we'll see how things progress. But uh, when it's available, I'm sure you'll find out about it through Handspring and all the usual social media channels. We'll be talking with uh, with a lot of experts and writers and researchers uh, about all about the human body, not just about fascia. So with that, I want to come off the screen. We're going to do something. Okay, and this, uh, I learned this from my friend Kristen Schumacher, who uh, teaches neurovascular release. Uh, you see her website there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can also, I believe, uh, find out about her classes through anatomytrains.com. And Kristen actually has done something very, very difficult. She's, uh, and she's done it very well. She's taken uh, the neurovascular release that she's teaching. She's teaching it in a self-care way online, and then adapting that to how to teach other people to do it to themselves in case you're in an environment where you're not fortunate like me to actually be able to work and touch people right now. And I got to tell you, she's doing a fantastic job at it. it it's, it's difficult enough in person, let alone in this virtual environment. So if you like what we're going to do today, I, I can't recommend uh, what she's doing more highly. So I have these slides up because what we're going to do is we're going to do some gentle stretching and traction for our carotid artery, which has a lot to do with circulation in our brain. And like a lot of you, I've been suffering from COVID brain. It just takes more energy and more uh, everything to just get through the day. Uh, and hey, guess what's also uh, right there around the carotid artery, uh, that part of your vagus nerve, the nerve that helps everything chill out. And uh, that's a really, really good thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some gentle stretching and traction for the carotid artery, for the vagus nerve, uh, and see how that goes and what we feel. And before I do that, a little contraindication, if you've had a stroke recently, do not do this. Um, if you have uh, any kind of blood clots, do not do this. Other than that, if you're prone to any kind of dizziness uh, or vertigo, do not do this just because you're there by yourself and there's nobody there to help you out, okay? But you can still watch and learn, okay? So the first thing I want everyone to do is just tilt their head to the left and tilt their head to the right. And what you're feeling for is where do I feel more tension? When I tilt to the right or when I tilt to the left? Take your head back. Take your head forward and down. Come back to the middle. Do it again. And just decide, okay, which, where am I feeling? Now me, I'm feeling the most tension when I tilt to the right. And I think you can see I go down better on the left. So anyway, we're going to do a little sums up for that. So you're going to take your hand or hands and you're going to put them on your sternum right near the manubrium, the very top of the sternum, okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to hug your sternum, okay? So just think about yourself giving yourself a hug, okay? So there's enough, there's enough tension there that you can feel it without like really compression. Okay, good. Now, while you're hugging your sternum, 
you're going to slowly traction down, okay? So your hands will barely move, but you can feel that you're pushing on the tissue, okay? So you're, you're hugging and you're tractioning down towards the floor. And then you're going to very slowly stretch the way on the side that you felt the tightness. In my case, my left side was tighter inside bending. So I'm going to go ahead and slowly traction and slowly. Oh, yeah. So I'm feeling a little pleasant tingle behind my ear. That's very nice. So what we're trying to do here is really give a little traction to our vascular system and the nerves and give them, oh wow, my deltoid just relaxed. Feel what you're feeling. And we can talk about it in a minute, okay? And just keep going gently, slowly in that direction, okay? And you can increase the traction a little bit as you go over if that feels appropriate. If you like where you're at, that's fine too, okay? And my body's actually saying, take your head a little bit forward. So I'm actually bringing my chin a little bit closer to the computer. So yeah, and now I'm catching something back near my levator scapula. How about that? So yeah, if you get a little feedback from your body that you want to alter that stretch a little bit, just do it very, very, very slowly so that uh, any adjustments you make, you can adapt to. You know, if you're driving, and you don't see the speed bump or you don't see the pothole and you hit it at 30 miles an hour, it shakes everything up. If you're going at five miles an hour, you can negotiate with it better. That's kind of how I feel about the body. So come on back up off that. Wow. Take a moment. Interocept. And uh, I don't know about you, but the whole left side of my body feels different now. And if I go back, I don't know, you can tell me because you're looking. I feel like I'm getting a lot further over than I did before I did that stretch. Let's go ahead, let's take a minute, let's do the other side. So we don't want to feel too weird. So remember, think about hugging yourself, hugging your sternum, hugging your heart. And then bring some traction down. And the other thing you can imagine is almost like your head's a balloon or there's a balloon attached to your head and it's just lifting your head slowly in the direction that you want to go while you're hugging your sternum and maintaining the traction. So you got the hug, you got the traction and you got the balloon. Somebody please cue the lo-fi trance music. Okay, I just felt my right sinus open. That was lovely. Okay. And I just felt something do something very nice between C1 and C2. So not only is this something lovely that you can uh, teach your clients to do for themselves, uh, or even work with adapting this technique to do it uh, in a direct way with your clients and patients. It's a lovely thing to do for yourself, particularly when you're feeling stressed. Uh, if you just need a quick reset um, and, and also to explore uh, a little more directly your own inner universe. So uh, with that, I wanna thank you all for uh, spending some time with me today. Uh, and why don't we get to the questions part? Take it away, Elizabeth. Yes. David, given that your book has been translated to 10 languages now, do, and we have people from a number of different uh, parts of the world on the participating in the webinar, um, do you have some, uh, some comments or some reflections on how this um, uh, application of fascia research to manual movement therapies, how that is taking place in different parts of the world? What feedback do you get from your readers? Um, well, that, <laughs> that's a really good question. And nobody's ever asked me that question, Elizabeth. Uh, wow. <laughs> Just doing my job, David. Yeah, right that's great. You. 
Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I love that when that happens. Um, well, and, and I got to say, the, the the first few things I thought of were rather self-aggrandizing. So I have to kind of uh, take, take a step back from that. Um, it, it's been lovely to see uh, the reception of the book. Uh, so the way it's been, by the way, this is this is the Chinese version, uh, the complex Chinese version that just came out. I just happen to have that handy. Um, and that, you know, the, the, the reaction from the critics uh, is that, okay, wow, it's, um, you really make the science understandable and, and we really like the way it's written. Uh, the feedback I get from the clinicians uh, and the people using the book, the, the audience is that like, wow, um, I can actually understand all this complicated stuff now. Um, I was hoping to have the more deeper answer to your question this year, Elizabeth, because I was supposed to go teach in uh, UK and Korea and France and um, Lisbon, and none of these things happened. <laughs> so in terms of the impact that it's having, um, you know, I can't say how it's moving the ball forward in terms of uh, getting uh, fascia and fascial based therapies more recognized by conventional medicine, though that's certainly uh, my goal here. I, I do recall getting a, a lovely uh, letter from a doctor in Italy who, um, and it's not in Italian, but he read the English and it made him think, rethink some of the way he treats certain cardiovascular conditions and what he recommends for that. And that's not even in the book. Um, so that was a phenomenal bit of, um, of taking what he learned from the book and thinking, well, if I take this, that, and the other thing, and I put it together and put it in my context, maybe that means that this condition can get a different result if I do X as opposed to the thing I used to do. So that's the thing that is really, really exciting to me that there, you know, and, and for every, the, the rule of thumb in, in most marketing and in most of these things is for every one person you hear from, there's probably eight or nine other people that, that have a similar reaction that you don't hear from. Um, so in that respect, it, it's very gratifying. So I'm assuming that that's going on in other places. Uh, and the fact that it's, it's recognized, being recognized academically uh, tells me that it, it's going in the right direction. But I, I would have had a more specific answer to you on that, but I didn't have that direct personal interaction uh, that I was planning to uh, this year. So next year at this time, ask me that question again, because everything's been rescheduled for 2021. I'll remember it. Uh, so we have a question of a comment from uh, Dimple Kwar uh, mentioning, I even felt my diaphragm relaxing um, and requesting a longer webinar focused on more application areas. Uh, mm -hmm. David, perhaps you could suggest some, um, some resources or how people can can follow uh, can follow you or others you recommend uh, regarding self care practices that relate so well to this current research. Well, first off, I want to say hi, Dimple Carr. What a fantastic name you have! I mean, that is <laughs> that is just delightful. I cannot say your name without smiling. Um, and and what a what a fabulous way to, for you to move through the world. Um, I'm curious what part of the country you're from. Uh, or what country you're from. Um, and that's great that you felt your diaphragm relaxing. Good on you. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Kristen Schumacher, who uh, is uh, agilebodysi.com. Uh, she's also available through the Anatomy Trains website. She, is, uh, she has redesigned the courses. I was going to take one of them uh, on the neurovascular releases to be more self-care oriented. And I'm just a huge, huge fan of hers because uh, she's somebody I want to learn everything she knows. Um, and uh, one of the other resources, and I can, let me, let me put that in the notes here. Uh, so everybody has the right URL. Okay, agilebodysi.com, there it is. Um, and the other one is that, I'm, that, that I really like is uh, Chris and Ann Fredericks uh, of uh, Fascial Stretch Therapy and Stretch to Win. They've created a self-stretch version 
or I should say self self stretch versions because there's some of their uh, some of that FST stuff really hard to do by yourself, but some of it they very cleverly figured out how you can do that on your own, and uh, that is also available to you. And they're just two of the loveliest people and funnest people in the world to learn from. Well, that's not quite it. So I'm putting their website on here. Stretch to win? No, there we go. Yeah. Uh, so, right. David, so uh, Chris, Chris, and Anne there. Frederick were guests on this. Chris and Anne Frederick were guests on this webinar a couple of uh, months ago. At that, um, mm -hmm. celebrating the uh, the second edition of their book, mm -hmm. and so um, and Chris Frederick led the group in some of uh, material that you just described, so people could access the Handspring um, YouTube. And Hillary, you could perhaps put that in the, the chat uh, reference also. Okay. And um, the other person uh, I am a big fan of is, and I just put her in the comments, Jill Miller. Uh, and she is a uh, rolling and bawling uh, self-help person. And I, for the love of me, Jill, don't, don't. I, uh, her book is called uh, The Role Model, R-O-L-L -L Model, um, and I am blanking on the name of, uh, of her website right now, uh, but if you, just, if you just type in Jill Miller and uh, Rolling uh, or Jill Miller um, Method, it'll come right up, but I, I really like uh, I like the way that when she's conducting self-treatment modalities, she always has a substitute. If you don't have the, the right tool, ball, or gadgety thing, she actually has a substitute that you can use that, that you have in your kitchen or in your bedroom or, or something. So I love her adaptation. And she is just brilliant at communicating the felt inner experience that you should be having while you're doing it. And that is an art form because... You know, I, I'm thinking of the guy who came into me with IT band syndrome. Fantastic guy. Climbed Mount Kilimanjaro on New Year's about five years ago. But he developed IT band syndrome. And uh, he didn't understand why it was getting better because he was foam rolling it. He was foam rolling it a half an hour a day for a month. It's like, well, I think I know why it's not getting any better. So uh, with, with Jill, your body is in good hands because uh, you absolutely will know if you're doing it right or if you're not doing it right in uh, how to adapt. And you know, it's just, it's killing me. I was just talking to Jill yesterday and I can see her website, but uh, as I said, it's there and uh, you should be able to find it. Um, David, let's take, let's take this question from Katrina Patterson. Do you have any thoughts on the unexplained pain that people with lipoderma experience when their legs are just gently touched? Lipoderma affects a lot of uh, people, mainly women, worldwide. Hmm. Lipoderma. I've never heard of that before. Let's look up lipoderma. Lipodermatosclerosis. Okay. Hmm. All right. Uh, paniculitis. Well, hey, you know, the superficial facet is also called panicular fascia. So there you go. Um, so is this, uh, so I got to ask you, uh, is this related to scleroderma? And if so, how? Um, well, we're, we're waiting to hear more from Katrina to um, oh, clarify her question. Lipoedema. Okay. So there's a swelling component involved in this? Mm. Oh, look, Jill Miller just emailed me. She must have like, she must have caught <laughs> up. That is just too weird. So, so yeah, can you explain a little bit more about um, lipoedema? Can, can we unmute you? Can we unmute her? Can you just talk to us? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so I think, um, gonna, David, like, David yeah. while, while, while we are gathering this uh, information, um, mm -hmm. let's take a look at the slide that shows people how to get a uh, the discount code on your book. And okay. then we'll come back and continue the discussion. 
Okay. So you can see that uh, David's book, Fascia, What It Is and Why It Matters, um, is available for the 25% off. And you can take a screenshot of this slide. Also, um, you can see how you can get in touch with David via his email at the University uh, Medical Center in Pittsburgh and his, uh, how you can get in touch with him on social media. Uh, just to let you know that at the end of this month, September 30th, Susan Lowell and Graham Scar uh, will be uh, speaking on their books with Handspring about uh, biotensegrity in movement. Okay, David, back to okay. you and the discussion at hand. At the discussion at hand. Um, all righty. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. One of the things I love about having done this for 30 years is that I'm still hearing about things I've never heard of before, like lipoedema. I've treated edema without any hyper sensitivity many, many times. Um, so uh, when I hear lipoedema, I'm thinking it's one that happens after you get liposuction, but I'm probably wrong about that. Um, that was a joke, Elizabeth. So anyway, um, so uh, but but sometimes jokes are actually serious um, <laughs> effects. I'm like, yeah. So anyway, um, so but here's what I would speak to that in general. Okay, so um, can so so give me a yes or no, Katrina. Oh, great deal. Are they too sensitive to even like have? fabric on that part of the body. It's like if it was in their lower leg, they'd have to wear shorts and not pants. Would you say that's true? Yes or no? It varies. Okay. Um, so uh, are you a manual therapist, Katrina? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, See, so it's kind of working. So, um, all right. So what I do in cases uh, where people are hyper hypersensitive is one, you obviously want to use your lightest touch possible. Um, so are they sensitive even if they touch themselves there or can they touch them and you have lipoedema. So what happens when you touch yourself there? So you can touch yourself there and it's okay. It's sensitive. All right. So, um, cause usually when I have people with, a with a hypersensitivity issue is I have them put their hand on my hand because, um, there's this. Um, interesting, one of the more interesting bits of research that I'm still unpacking is the idea that part of that kind of hypersensitivity is actually predicated on our expectations. So how do we very sensitively confound those expectations? And, um, and it's, it's, it's almost a little too woo for me to talk about, um, but I really respect uh, the DO in Italy who's researching uh, this kind of interoceptive phenomenon. Not that it's all in the brain, but that the brain play that the brain plays a big part of it too, uh, as as much and sometimes in cases more than the tissue does. But I'm still trying to make sense of his work that I can then regurgitate it effectively. Um, and I can look up his name here in a minute. Let me see here. Uh, people bruise easily and have venous insufficiency. Wow. Wow. That's, that, that's a question. I don't have a, it's not, first of all, it's a question that, that doesn't lend itself to an easy answer, nor a quick answer. Um, certainly the pain receptors in the fascia are affected, uh, by swelling. And there's certainly the ones that are stuck on calling 911 and don't know how to do anything else. Uh, I, um, let me, let me, I will look into this. I will look into this, Katrina. And um, one of the things I want to do for my podcast is actually uh, do regular episodes called Ask the Experts. So these are the kind of questions that I want to get in and then I can find the right expert to talk to, record that, and then we can all hear it. Um, but you've got my email address there and I'm going to put it here in the message because if you would do me the favor of just sending me an email because I've got a couple of very busy clinical days coming up and it'll be in my head, but I don't want to remember it two weeks from now. 
So if you would just send me a quick little reminder, uh, and then I have your email, I can actually put some brain power on this because I don't want to give you an off the cuff, um, an off the cuff uh, answer without more research. That would be irresponsible. Sorry. David, I'm thinking of the article um, written, the first uh, first author is Antonio Stecco, and then a number of other authors, and Carla Stecco, too, um, which takes a look at the, uh, the different aspects of the fascial system and their responses to uh, manual work. Uh, so it's possible that the that the Stecco research, uh, because the paper I'm thinking of is already a few years old, and I'm sure they've updated it also. Mm -hmm. um, well, and this is part of what uh, what we are. And when I say we are, I mean we are uh, trying to put together at the uh, International Congress for Manual Therapies next year, is uh, which is being which is a co-creation of Brian Dengahart. Uh, and Andrew Tabor Still University and Paul Stanley at the University of Arizona is, uh, it, it, you know, are being able to have conversations like this from a multiplicity of viewpoints. I don't know the specific Stecco and Stecco paper that you're referring to. Uh, I'm sure I have it somewhere, but I've been spending a lot of time reviewing all those things uh, for this conference. So it's not immediately blinging into mind, but if you have it and could send me a screenshot later, I'd really appreciate that because maybe it's one I don't have or you'll help me focus on the right one to look at. So thank you for that. Does anybody else have any questions or a reaction? Um, somebody's gonna send me some film of German women. Just make sure it's you know on the up and up. Um, unless you, Katrina, sorry. <laughs> so anyway. Lively sense of humor. So it's so strange going for jokes in the audience. You don't know if they're landing or if you have to do a follow-up joke or if you should just slunk, slink and walk away. That is the hardest part. I was really hoping for when I speak at the Australia Fascia Symposium that I could do something like this and be upside down for it, but it doesn't work. I tried it, you know, uh, and then go right side up for it because, you know, how can you have fun with the medium? Um, anyhow, uh, David, like speaking of <laughs> speaking of different orient, yes, yeah, speaking of different orientations, mm -hmm. I, I'm reaching now to make a bridge. But given that you went upside down for a minute there, <laughs> speaking of different speaking of different orientations, I'm um, curious about your recommendations to those of us in the field in manual therapy or movement um, educators, um, how to go to bridge the gap between our daily experience in the clinic or in the movement lab where we teach that apparent gap between that and then the the conferences the papers we read the books we read um where there's there's research and then there's there's our experience and there's research mm -hmm. and how to um how to more elegantly um, bridge that information to bring each into the other world. So can, can you give me that? That sounds like there's, you've got a few stories behind that. Can you give me a, a, a specific example of when you experienced a disconnect between those two worlds? Ah, um, my colleagues and I are, um, eager participants, uh, attendees of uh, FASA research symposia, FASA research congresses, conferences. And um, we meet at the break after listening to very well-informed speakers on their current research. And we look at each other over our coffee and tea cups and saying, so what am I going to do differently with my clients on Monday when I go back to work? Mm hmm. Okay. And so what you're saying is sometimes after hearing that you look at each other over your teacups and go, I don't know. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes, like it's fascinating. I'm, that, I'm, I, so, I, I'm so glad I came. And now what? <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, um, and that's where it's important to actually talk to the researchers. Mm. Okay because um, I can remember the first Fashion Congress and talking um, um, and talking to several of the researchers 
who they they were like blah blah blah. They they were um they didn't they were surprised that somebody like me was interested in their research. So so the best way uh, to do that is is start building those bridges, uh, you know, on an individual basis. Um, particularly if there's a researcher, you know, and, and I got to tell you, there are um, some of those presentations, I'm going, okay, um, I'm not sure that that's relevant to me. And there's other ones where it's like, um, and I can remember uh, talking with Tom Finley. So for those of you who uh, may not know, Tom Finley is an MD, he's a PhD, he's a structural integrator, uh, his Father invented epoxy, that, that kind of, oh yeah, and he wrote the afterword to my book. Uh, and it was him that Robert Schleit put together the first fascia conference, okay? So I remember talking to Tom Finley and he was like, you know, David, I, um, we're getting ready to do this next conference and I, I've read all the papers twice and, and I've watched all the videos from the previous conference five or six times and of course I was there. And I feel like maybe, maybe I understand 40 to 50% of what happened in the other ones. And I'm getting ready to do the next one. And I thought, wow, I'm too hard on myself. So even the expert experts don't get it all. Um, so um, if you find a researcher or a particular lecture that you're like, wow, I, there was something there, but I'm not sure what it is. Try to engage the researcher in dialogue and, and try to talk to them about, well, here's what I do. And here's what I thought I understood, but what I didn't understand um, and, and like that, uh, and, and, and begin to build those bridges on an individual basis. That's the single best thing we can all do. The, the other thing we can do is to, and scientific papers are hard to read, okay? Um, even for someone who spends a lot of time reading them. So um, I, I admire anybody who's gonna try to do that. Um, in the chat box, I put in a book recommendation called Science Fictions. And it's an excellent, <laughs> excellent book about bad research, research that doesn't work well. There's a fantastic chapter in there on how to read a research paper. And the guy's a fantastic writer. It, 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 it's, it's a book that's just easy to sit there. It's a page turner. It is an honest to God, legitimate page turner. So part of it is to just become smarter in learning how to think in that sciencey way. Um, and then you begin to make the connections. I, I, I can speak to, um, you know, as, as I moved forward in, in my understanding of the science, uh, I might have been taught one thing. And then because I have gained and, and shared in my book uh, a deeper understanding of the mechanisms behind fascial change, um, I was less intimidated by dealing with circumstances and conditions people walked into my office with that I had never seen before because I could apply the concepts. So, hmm, if the cells that produce the collagen respond to the direction and somebody's shoulders are up around their ears, why would I do what most massage therapists do, put them face down and work up the back? No, I'm gonna put them face down and work down the back. So the fibroblasts get this idea of down towards the feet people. Now I was kind of taught to do that, but oh, there's actually a good physiological reason for that. So if that's so, where else could I apply it in the body besides just this one area? And by the way, that also explains, it gives me a better reason of why I do what I do rather than that's what Tom Myers taught me because that's what he learned from Ida Rolf. So the more you understand the mechanisms of change, the more I think you can apply them in different ways. So and David, uh, on on that note, <laughs> yes, you got great guests coming up at the end <laughs> on, of the on end. that on through. that note. Um, we'll just we'll appreciate your uh, your recommendations to us as we continue living, reading, learning, attending conferences, and building those individual bridges. Yes. So we are at uh, thirteen minutes after the hour, and I suspect that you are your next. Uh, next client, next patient at the University Medical Center is coming. And we'll look forward to being with everybody uh, the next time uh, with uh, Graham Scar and Susan Lowell, each of which has their own handspring books out on biotensegrity. Mm -hmm. David, thank you very much. 
You're welcome. One last thing, Dimple's saying she's having trouble accessing the chat. So Dimple, you've got my email address on the slide. Just email me and uh, I'll send you the relevant stuff. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I'll see you in Montreal in 2021. Yes. Thank you, David. Bye. Bye. <laughs>